Hey, thanks. Uh, and I'm very happy indeed that I made it down here to uh, visit this lovely city for the first time. So um, today I'll be, so, so, so feel free to interrupt me anytime if something's not clear or if you have a burning uh, question. Today I'll be talking about chicken uh, and uh, antibiotic. And my hope really is that uh, I can maybe help you think about the fact that we are increasingly playing a dangerous game with using uh, antibiotics uh, in the way we produce uh, food. And in that context, I'll try to illustrate uh, how geospatial modeling as a tool that was initially developed by ecologists to map the species appearance uh, can be used to try to accelerate and, and optimize the rest, this response that we bring to this problem really on a, on a global level. Uh, but before anything else, uh, my most important slide for today, I'd like to thank the current and past members of my group, uh, including those uh, who graduated in, in Montpellier. Uh, and we work very much as a team with people from all around the world, and it's to a large extent their work uh, I'll, be, I'll be presenting uh, today. And also I'd like to thank uh, my mentors who helped me sort of think about these research questions and those who've been generous enough to spend uh, all of this research in the past few. So uh, to dive in, I'd like to start by presenting you the work of a photographer. He's called Peter Menzel, and what he did is that he went around the world with his camera to take a picture of what a week worth of groceries looks like uh, in different uh, parts uh, of the world. So here we start the, the journey uh, in, in, in Mali. Uh, and as you can see, there isn't that much uh, animal protein on the menu uh, of this family. And people tend to have very little money that they can spend on their uh, weekly groceries. Now, uh, if we move to a middle income country, like China, uh, you can see that people have more money to spend on food, and the amount of animal protein has already increased. Then you probably see where I'm going next. If we do this for a very high income country, like Australia, uh, there's a lot of animal protein uh, on the table. Now, of course, just three pictures uh, don't have scientific value, but they illustrate nevertheless a very consistent trend, which is when we have more money, we tend to spend more money on food and uh, to, especially on, uh, on animal protein. So we, we get richer, we eat more meat. And the result of this global shift in, in diet means that we essentially now live in a world that looks uh, very much like this. So if we compare the, the biomass expressed in uh, dry tons of, of carbon, we realize that we live in a world where, well, the biomass of the animals that we raise for our own food production uh, outweighs by far our own biomass and by very far what it is left of wildlife uh, on, on them. And so the question I'd like to put to you is, if you were a pathogen, uh, where would you like to go? So for me, it's pretty clear. That if I were a pathogen, I'd like to pick the species that are abundant and distributed everywhere uh, across uh, the world. And many pathogens seem to have chosen this path because 60% of the disease that we have today in humans have an, an animal uh, origin. And many uh, have uh, spread easily in, in domestically uh, raised animals. So over the years, my interest has been on several diseases. So I, I received my initial training in spatial analysis on uh, working on malaria uh, at Oxford. Then I did my PhD on the spatial epidemiology of, of bird flu in, in, um, in Northern uh, Thailand. Uh, and then since my postdoc at Princeton, my interest has been focused on uh, the problem of overuse antibiotic and antibiotic resistance. I worked a little bit in human, but then it was very much focused on uh, the, uh, the animal uh, side. And now the approach I tried to take on these diseases is to combine a statistical model with very large data sets to try to produce uh, maps and make projection of where these drug resistant pathogens uh, may, be, may be found. So now let's look together as really the simplest possible example of what uh, disease mapping uh, consists uh, in with the case of bird flu in Thailand. So let's imagine we have a data set about farm locations, so typically coordinates on the map. And some of these farms have bird flu outbreak, the one in red on the top left. Here. And we also have data about distribution of chicken and ducks, which are healthy carriers of most uh, avian influenza uh, viruses. Uh, also uh, maps of the distribution of, of rivers and wetlands, as well as the distribution of uh, rice feeds. And so uh, if we're talking GIS language, so this is the geographic information system, so how we deal with maps on computers, 
This would come in the form of raster images. So these are big matrices with numbers that uh, correspond to the density of the variable uh, that you that you. And you can use that at the location of your uh, your farms in outbreak to train a statistical model to try to generate a large scale uh, and try to re train that model and then reapply it to the ent entire imagery that you have. Try to generate a map of the probability of presence of the disease uh, in the landscape. And the simplest example of that would be simply to have a logistic regression model where your response variable is one or zero presence or absence of the disease and your covariates are the different variables that I uh, described uh, before here. And then you reapply that to, to your entire imagery and you have a map with values varying between zero and one that tells you where to go uh, for the disease. And so now you have a map. Well, what can you do with that? Well, first and foremost, you can try to use it to target uh, surveillance in the areas that are most affected. And in Thailand, this has been the case with sort of orienting surveillance for, for outbreaks uh, of bird flu. You can identify other geographical factors that may be associated with the presence, absence uh, of the disease. Uh, but you can also use this map to inform like movement ban policies, for example. So in 2008 and 9, movements of chicken and duck were restricted in certain districts uh, in Thailand, much in the same way that we had COVID lockdown that were sometimes uh, regional. And you can use this map to sort of justify those decisions uh, by the government and then in court it's stated challenge by uh, farmers or, or local local folks. And then, oh, sorry, I forgot to click on this one. Uh, the last point of interest, uh, of interest is if you are an international funder, you can use these maps across different countries to try to prioritize your efforts to distribute uh, surveillance capacity or intervention capacity uh, between different countries that are affected by, by the same problem. So, for the past few years, I've been trying to work on adapting these methods that were fairly well established for vector bone disease to the case of uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, in, in animals. So today I'll try to, to address four little topics on the general theme of uh, antimicrobial resistance. And first, perhaps for those of you who may not be so familiar with the issue of resistance, I'd like to uh, emphasize why it's an important business. So, why is it a problem? So after Fleming discovered the penicillin, it was sort of widely distributed first to the, the American soldiers during the Second World War and, the, and then the, in, the, in the community uh, up to today. And many classes of antibiotics were discovered, and this has helped sort of considerably reduce the risk that would, of, of death associated with a uh, very common uh, infectious disease uh, and death. But we then start to realize that for every new class of drug that has been introduced over the last 70 years or so, a few years later, we started reporting a resistance to those drugs. And then we were able to investigate what are the mechanism involved and what maybe the genes involved uh, in this resistance. But the bottom line is, it has reduced our ability to treat, uh, to treat infection. And this has uh, already started with uh, pathogens like uh, vaccine or, or gonorrhea. So some gonorrhea infection now are almost impossible to treat because they are resistant to pretty much every drug we have, we used to have to, to, to treat them. But the problem of resistance is not just only that we're getting drugs that, uh, drugs that are impossible uh, to treat, but it affects many aspects of medicine because modern medicine relies so much on the fact that drugs work. So for example, uh, simple surgeries like hip replacement would take an antibiotic uh, when you have that or when you uh, when you have a, a C-section, a you also have antibiotics. So if we can't rely on antibiotics to do these basic things, we also increase the mortality that may be associated with those uh, procedures. And of course, uh, patients on, on, on chemo, people who have cancer, uh, may need to take uh, antibiotic in a, in a prophylactic uh, way. And so recently, the, the Global Burden of Disease Collaboration, which is based at the University of, of Washington in the US, uh, they try to quantify the number of deaths from AMR each year, and there's still quite a bit of uncertainty around this, but it's probably the best number out there at the moment. It's at least 1.3 million deaths per year that are attributable to antibiotic uh, resistance. So in and of itself, that doesn't tell us much. But when you start comparing to other sort of big killer, you realize how big of a problem it has become. So AMR kills more than HIV AIDS at the moment. It kills more than uh, malaria. It even kills more than breast cancer, which is one of the most uh, common cancers. So you probably all around us know about somebody who had breast cancer. So this gives us a sense of how frequent death from AMR might become 
uh, in the future. And compared to uh, my specialty is infectious disease, compared to malaria and, and HIV, the MR definitely gets much less publicity than those two diseases uh, so far. So we really hope that these global estimates will help sort of, uh, shift uh, the way we look at AMR uh, in the future. So I'm not a vet, and if AMR kills so many uh, people, why am I interested in animals? Well, for a simple reason that the vast majority of the antibiotics that we produce uh, on this planet, they're actually uh, given to animals. Mostly to prevent infections, so when they're not sick yet, or to promote growth. Because if you feed antibiotic in low doses over extended periods of time to pigs and chicken, it helps improve what the farmers call the feed conversion ratio. So in other words, they make more protein out of the same amount of food. And so the farmers uh, can save some money uh, on food by providing less food, which is an important cost uh, for them. Uh, but therefore, there are many opportunities for resistant genes to sort of emerge uh, in the animal reservoir. And that can eventually result in untreatable infections uh, in the clinic. And although the exact number of infection that is attributable to use of antibiotics uh, in animals is, is very difficult and very challenging uh, to quantify, but there's clearly a role there as a reservoir for new resistant genes uh, in, in, in animals. So when we got interested in the topic, we thought that a good starting point uh, would be to see where are the hotspots of uh, consumption of veterinary antibiotics uh, on the planet. So we embark on this exercise to simply try to build the first global map of antibiotic use uh, in animals. So there we assemble all the sales data that we could find on veterinary uh, antimicrobials. And at the time, we managed to find, uh, actually, this is an update. So the first time was 37 countries, not, not, not 40. Uh, we used data about chicken, cattle, and pig, which together represent about 95% of the biomass of, of livestock. So if you know what's going on in these three species, you know, more of what, you know most of what is happening. And we use projection from FAO. Uh, so these are economists who work on trying to projecting the demand of uh, the meat uh, in the next uh, in the next 20 years. And then we try to introduce distinction in intensity of antibiotic use between extensive farmers that do more sort of farming for subsistence and local consumption versus a large scale uh, industrial uh, production of chicken. So the general idea of our methodology is super simple. We try to estimate the coefficient of this of this regression. So on one side, we have the total amount of antibiotic used. And on the right side, we have regressors, which are the amount of uh, animals raised uh, intensively uh, in, uh, in each country. So you have a total amount of antibiotic and pig. Uh, it's only one of the three variables. So the total, total amount of pig uh, in, in the country. Uh, and there, the first important result was to see that you know, a chicken and pig, that's the value of this coefficient here. Chicken and pig, yeah, and we do that in the Bayesian framework. So we, we use some, some trials from the literature for those coefficients, and then we get these posteriors for these coefficients. And chicken and pig tend to use quite a bit more antibiotic uh, than cattle. And we believe that to be because chicken and pig production can be more readily intensified and detached from the, the, the ground uh, than is the case uh, than is the case for cattle. So we have those coefficients, and then we combine it with maps of population uh, densities uh, for pig, chicken, and, and cattle. For the entire world. And the disaggregation between intensive and extensive production here is based on the relationship with the GDP per capita. So the richer a country is, the larger is the share of the proportion of animals that is produced in an intensive, uh, in intensive setting. And while doing that, uh, the metric we use to quantify the biomass of livestock, and I'll just make a long story short here. Uh, on the left, we have the total biomass in kilogram. And here on the right, we have essentially three factors the number of animals, and we keep this number separate because we have maps of numbers uh, of animals rather than productivity. But then we try to account for productivity by including here the number of production cycle in the year. So if it takes 30 days to make a chicken, in modern farming, that's what it takes. You can make a uh, 12 cycle uh, a year. And then the amount of meat that is taken from the animal. So that's essentially a ratio between uh, the, the live weight and the carcass weight. So it's the percentage that you can get out of a full animal. So we multiply all of this together, and uh, this is a result. Uh, so what we obtain is a map with uh, the amount of antimicrobial use in animal in every 10 by 10 kilometer pixel uh, in, in, in the world. And then we can re-aggregate this information on a national level. 
And so in 2019, which is the last reference year for which uh, we did this exercise, we had uh, about 90,000 tons of antimicrobial used uh, in the world. China was by far the country with the largest consumption, about half the antibiotics in the world at the time were used uh, in China. And uh, by 2030, Asia will represent two thirds of the global uh, consumption, while Africa will only be 6% of the global consumption of antibiotics. So they arguably bear little responsibility in Africa about the current situation uh, with resistance, and perhaps it could be good to exempt them for very restrictive measures uh, in the future, since they're not responsible for the current mess, so to speak. And in Europe and North America, we have historically high level of antibiotic use, but over the last 10 years or so, there's been stewardship program that have helped sort of curb this down, but fairly slowly. So um, there were 40 countries uh, reporting, and then we, we tried to look at what makes a country report. So what makes a, a country more likely to report uh, antimicrobial uh, use? And what we, we realized is that the larger your share of export in your livestock production, the more likely you were to be in the reporting group rather than the non-reporting group. And the mechanism that's happening there is essentially, in order to secure some, uh, some export market, uh, some countries tend to report uh, their sales to show some degree of transparency. And Thailand would be a good example of that. But most of the, the chicken that you may have in, in ready meals here when you go to the supermarket, most, a lot of it in Europe uh, would be uh, made and pre-cooked in Thailand and then uh, shipped here. So they, they really care about keeping sort of a good image and showing, look, we're transparent about antibiotic problem and trying to do something about it. Notable exception to that, of course, is Brazil, uh, which is probably the least trans transparent country in the world when it comes to antibiotic use, and unfortunately also the largest chicken uh, exporter uh, in the world. But the idea of, of looking at, at this is that perhaps imposing high standards uh, for production uh, to countries uh, outside, of, outside of Europe uh, is, is maybe not so fair to the extent that within Europe, we also have huge variation in the level of antibiotic use that we have uh, between different countries. In particular, Southern European countries tend to use a huge amount of antibiotic for, for food production. So the next step, uh, was of course to see, uh, well, what does all of this excess of antibiotic use uh, mean for, for resistance? Because ultimately that's what we care about, is resistance level in, in animals. So in Europe, we had surveillance system for 20, sometimes 30 years. If you look at Scandinavian countries who are really at the, the forefront of, of uh, this issue. And the existence of that data has really helped shape uh, policies and stewardship campaign. And in particular, what I described earlier uh, that uh, some antibiotic may be used as growth promoters by being fed in small doses over an extended period of time. In Europe, we're not officially allowed to do that. Anymore. So since 2006, uh, this, this has been banned. And then this, this is largely because uh, we have those surveillance systems showing you know, we have a problem with doing this sort of practice. Uh, but as you've seen, uh, most of the problem with the excess of antibiotic use now seem to be in middle-income countries, China, India, places, places like that. And so, what we try to do is to say, well, we should look at antibiotic resistance uh, in, 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 in those countries for the future. So we went to look for systematic surveillance data uh, in the public domain for low and middle income countries. Uh, but the problem here was rather simple. So there are 135 low and middle income countries in the world. And in 2019, one uh, had the govern, uh, surveillance system run by the government that generate public data. And for some reason, I don't understand, it was Colombia, which apparently seemed to be very uh, upfront uh, on the issue of, of resistance. So if we want to inform policy in the short term, clearly we need an alternative source of information for low and middle income countries. And uh, where we've seen earlier that, unfortunately, that's where meat consumption is going to happen. So our approach was to take advantage of a largely untapped source of uh, information, which is the 100 small point preference surveys that are done uh, around the world by veterinarians going near their institutes or to farmers they know uh, to look for resistance and sometimes try to hunt new resistant genes, which is something very popular among uh, microbiologists. Uh, so they do these surveys sometimes directly on the farm. More often they go to the to a market and buy pieces of meat, bring it back to the lab and look uh, what bacteria they can grow. Or sometimes it's done directly uh, at the slaughterhouse uh, level. But now these surveys are typically scattered across the literature. Uh, they are published in rather obscure journals, 
and the authors hardly get any uh, exposure, uh, which is a pity because it'd be a lot of useful groundwork there. So we assembled all the literature that we could find on four indicator bacteria. That's E. coli, Staph, Campylobacter, uh, and Salmonella. We looked for those bacteria in the, in the three big uh, livestock species, chicken, cat, uh, cat, and pig. And finally, we looked for resistance in all the drug pathogen combination that are recommended by the World Health Organization uh, for susceptibility testing. And so I'm uh, skipping through uh, months of uh, beautiful literature review, uh, but essentially we read a lot of papers. Uh, and so the next thing we did was to try to summarize the trends in resistance with a single index. Now there are almost as many resistance indexes as there are people uh, working in, in, in my field. Uh, but our logic was to use something called uh, P50, which is the proportion of antimicrobials tested in a survey that had resistance higher than 50%. So let's take a quick, exam quick example. If we tested for nine drugs and you had six, six drugs uh, for which you had uh, more than 50% of your isolates that were resistant, we count that as, as, uh, as one drug resistant. And so here you had uh, six out of nine drugs that were above this 50% threshold. And that's the value of P50. If you only have two drugs like that, the value uh, decreases. So what did we find? We summarized the trend in resistance using this index, and uh, we followed the evolution of this metric uh, globally over the last uh, 18 years. And for chicken and pig, there's a clear increase in the proportion of drugs uh, that uh, are failing uh, in animals, whereas for cattle, things seem to be a little bit uh, more stable. So clearly, every year that passes, we lose the sort of options in the treatment portfolio to control disease uh, in, in animals. So once we've extracted all the information about the resistance rates, we put all of that uh, on, on, on the map. And uh, altogether, this represents about 300,000 uh, biological uh, samples. And our goal for the next step was to try to use this, use this local information to make a global map of uh, resistance. So concretely, uh, like for the example with, uh, with bird flu, we want to move from point level information to continuous coverage of resistance rate to produce a heat map. So how do we do this? Uh, we use universal cricking as a mean to combine prediction from multiple geospatial models. So the version in French, sorry, in English, uh, is we say that resistance here depends on resistance level nearby a certain pixel plus the influence of covariate or risk factors that may be antimicrobial use, animal densities, travel time to cities, et cetera. So in practice, we use a two-step procedure to do that. First, we use a set of covariate to train multiple so-called child models to reflect the AMR level. In our case, we use boosted regression trees, uh, GAM models, lateral regression, and now we're also using a neural network to do that. And then we feed the prediction of those child models into universal cricking routine. And the goal of this is to capture any residual spatial autocorrelation that we may have, uh, sorry, that we may have in the initial uh, in the initial prediction. So we capture this aspect which expresses that resistance nearby can influence resistance uh, where, where I am. So we do that and we apply it to the entire world. And uh, this is our result. So it's a map of the proportion of drugs that failed uh, across low and middle income countries. One of the cool things, of course, is that you can zoom in to see where the problem uh, is. And in our case, the, the main region with hotspots of resistance were Uruguay in the south of Brazil uh, in the Americas, uh, Ethiopia and the suburbs of Johannesburg in, in Africa. And then in Asia, resistance level were generally very high, but in particular, South India, Northeast China, Northeast uh, India. So this map was sort of a starting point for other exercise that we tried to do to try to go beyond just uh, mapping the problem of uh, resistance. So one thing in particular that we've been uh, sort of trying to, to address uh, is how could we use our map to guide future surveillance campaigns and anchorage doing surveys, not in random location, but in location where getting more information could be the most valuable. And so we try to do that uh, with, with Cheng and Yu from, from my group in the case of China, collecting not only what we could find in the English speaking literature, but also using uh, 
Chinese national research infrastructure with all the papers in Chinese, which turn out are far more abundant than uh, what's only published in English. And the question we ask is if we had money, like $50 million to do 50 uh, surveys, where should we do these given the location of the existing surveys in order to minimize the uncertainty level that we have over the entire landscape of China? And the bonus question is, can we try to do this in a computationally efficient way? So we start by defining in each 10 kilometer uh, pixel, an index that we call the need for surveillance. And this is the product of the Kring variance. This is our uncertainty metric on the spatial interpretation and the animal population density. And this index is a compromise so that places where we're gonna put new surveys, they have high uncertainty, but they're not in the middle of the desert where we have hardly any uh, animals. So we try to, to make a compromise between the two to orient the surveillance. And our goal will be to minimize the value of this index for the whole of China, as we recursively add surveys into the landscape in different locations. Now there are two ways that you can go about this. The naive and greedy approach is you try adding a survey in each of the pixel of China, around 100,000, you select the position that gives maximum value of your need, and you do that 50 times. So that's 50 times 100,000. That's a lot of times trying, but we did it. And then you can compare that with what we call uh, an overlap approach, which is an approximate, which we hope is an approximation of the previous approach, which consists in placing a first survey where your need is the highest. And then you create an area of exclusion where you're going to reduce the degree of uncertainty based on the degree of overlap with the previous survey. And you're going to put your, your next survey in the next pixel with the highest uh, level uh, of uncertainty, and so on and so on. So, long story short, if you apply that, you can identify the location by order of low to high priority, where it would be the most valuable to add a survey in the landscape in order to decrease the overall spatial uncertainty uh, over, over China. And there we were able to identify that in particular the, the southwest, which is uh, one of the poor areas of China, is really under-surveyed uh, compared to what it should be surveyed if you wanted to follow this optimal approach. But now the funny thing was we compared this approach. So the greedy is the one that gives you the optimal solution in terms of reducing your needs as you add surveys in the landscape. Okay, that's expected because it has to be the optimal solution. But we show that the overlap approach comes rather close in terms of reducing your need for surveillance. But then we compare that with just throwing 50 points at random in the landscape or throwing one point uh, per province or per administrative division. And the problem is that most government, when you say we're going to do a national surveillance program, they're going to say, okay, we do one survey in every subdivision. And there we were able to show that actually this administrative approach would be the worst outcome possible in terms of uh, decreasing your, your uncertainty. So it's not uh, that we think the Chinese government would do that. We think all governments uh, would do that. And there's potentially a smarter way to go about it, which is uh, this overlap and target approach. So we also applied this sort of approach to the case of aquaculture uh, in Asia, where we follow the similar design to place surveys in, in areas that should get more attention in terms of uh, future surveillance. That was a work, work by Dan Shah from USAID, his PhD I supervised in, in Bangkok. Another question uh, was to see uh, whether drugstore play a role in aggravating resistance. So in Thailand, we had a small survey in the Konkan province in the north of Thailand where we could show that if your farm is located close to a drugstore, everything else being equal, this was an aggravating factor for the resistance level on the farm. So that is clearly an effect that the closer you live to the drugstore, uh, the more likely you are to seek your medical advice from the guy who sells you the drug, who of course has a massive conflict of interest. But that's how it seemed to work. Uh, then we try to look also at genomic information. So we. We looked at all the genomes in public database uh, that report having uh, drug resistant genes for animal associated isolates. And we built a multi drug resistance index. And we followed the evolution of this index uh, over the last uh, 30 years uh, since these uh, archives exist. And then we had a, a rather strikingly good uh, correspondence with what we found earlier from the phenotypic, uh, with, from the phenotypic data. And then finally, working on AMR is not uh, always bad news. Uh, here we work with the Canadian Public Health Agency uh, to essentially follow the trend in resistance after they implemented some more sort of uh, strict uh, cleaning uh, procedures and anchored decreasing antibiotic use at the same time. Uh, and there they were clearly able to get on top of the problem for most uh, resistance. So sometimes if you take the right measures, you can 
uh, move in the right uh, direction. And finally, beyond the sort of traditional paper, we try to propose also some uh, policy options to try to manage the problem of resistance. So for example, uh, if we were to cut antibiotic use in resistance to the median uh, European level, which is about 50 milligram per kilogram of meat uh, produced, we could, we could cut the world consumption of antibiotics by 64%. So that's quite big. Uh, but as long as China is in the deal, we could exclude all the other low and middle income countries we would get almost the same effect. So that would be a good argument to have a, a treaty on how to use antibiotic in the same way between China and uh, the OECD countries. And we could already do a lot together. If we were to limit ourselves to uh, 40 gram of meat a day, so that's just reducing our meat consumption. And 40 gram of meat a day, to uh, make things uh, clear, it's one slice uh, of meat that you have in a Big Mac. So that you can still eat one Big Mac a day. Uh, and you could cut antibiotic use by, by, by two thirds. And the last policy we, we looked into, I'm not going to get into details here, is to tax uh, veterinary antimicrobials. So here, if we were to tax antibiotics as, at 50%, we could reduce antibiotic use by uh, 31%. And the idea of a tax is, is double. First, you increase the price, so you make it not so worthwhile for the farmers to use it to make small productivity gain. But also, the cool thing about a tax is, is that it generates money for the state, right? And so this money could be potentially reinvested in a global fund to support the development of new drug, because developing a new antibiotic is about one to two billion in, in R&D. And so it seems it's like applying the polluter pays principle to say, okay, you want to use antibiotic, you have to pay more for it so that you fund the next generation of uh, anti antibiotic. And we, we could get something between two and four billion if we were to implement something like that uh, globally. So to finish, I'll say just a little bit uh, about uh, antibiotic use in fish. Uh, and at, at this stage, we know very uh, little, so I'll just touch upon the, the, the issue. So the most important point, perhaps, and those of you who work in aquaculture will be very familiar with this, uh, aquaculture is a very important source of animal uh, protein. And the most important is that it grows faster than any terrestrial livestock as a source of animal protein. So if we have a problem with AMR in aquaculture, this will grow uh, much faster than what we've seen in, in, in animals uh, so far. Uh, so it's, it's sort of wise to keep an, 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 an eye on it. Now the story of antimicrobial use uh, in aquaculture is typically pitched as a very positive story, uh, including by the World Health Organization. And the be best example of this is the case of uh, salmon farming, which is uh, most of the salmon we probably eat uh, when we go to the supermarket. So salmon farming, uh, in particular in Norway and Chile and, and Scotland, uh, it used to be associated with the highest rate of antibiotic consumption, like three or four times the maximum value you would have for pigs uh, today. And this has been brought largely under control uh, thanks to, to this thing. I don't know if it's gonna work here. It's not. Anyway, that's a video of an amazing machine that like vaccinates the salmon every second. Uh, with a vaccine that they've developed in reaction to this antibiotic overuse to control uh, this, this parasite, which was causing a bronchiolosis uh, on the salmon. And thanks to that, they've cut antibiotic use uh, really, uh, really dramatically. And usually uh, the story uh, stops, stops there. It is not, the problem is not that the story is false. Uh, the problem is that the story is not the whole, uh, the whole picture. So there we go. So if you work with antibiotic uh, in livestock, uh, you get chicken, cattle, and pig, you get 90% of the biomass of livestock, and you sort of know what's going on. If you want to do the same thing uh, with fish, uh, things are immensely more complex. So you need about 27 species uh, to make up 90% of the global biomass uh, of fish uh, consumption. And they all live in different parts uh, of the planet. They're not so homogeneously distributed as the, as the terrestrial livestock. Uh, and um, salmon in that is 4% of the global biomass. But I guarantee you, if you go to talks about air mine fish, it's always going to start by the positive story of how we brought the salmon uh, overuse antibiotic uh, into control with the, with the vaccine. And so uh, it's very important to sort of understand that uh, if we try to quantify the global consumption of antibiotic in fish, uh, it's very hard to get a fair, a fair picture. Because we reviewed this literature uh, systematically, 
and the most uh, reasonable figure we, we could come with was around 13,000 tons, so a little bit more than 10% of the global consumption of uh, antibiotics. But we were really humbled when doing this exercise because essentially uh, we found out that we know uh, very little. And out of the 146 surveys uh, that we reviewed, the two most commonly farmed fish in the world, which are two types of carps that are farmed in China for, for centuries, uh, we had two surveys about those. And so it makes the whole exercise sort of super sensitive uh, to a few species on which we don't have uh, any uh, information. So in agriculture, we really need to know more about what's going on in Asia in the species that are sort of traditionally farmed rather than focusing on a uh, fish farm in the West. So yeah, similar to what we did in, in China, we tried to uh, use information we had on resistance in fish to make a max of, maps of hotspots and cold spots of resistance in freshwater fish, define uh, areas of priority uh, for surveillance. And here, uh, very clearly, the main take home message is that uh, we should have a much bigger focus in the, on the Mekong Delta, the south of India, where there's a huge uh, shrimp production uh, industry in particular, and uh, inland China, in particular, the province of Sichuan, where uh, aquaculture is, is, is fairly big. And then we looked at resistance using uh, point prevalence surveys of, uh, of uh, cultured fish and, and captured fish. So that's uh, the fish that you fish. Um, and uh, in Asia, the average level of, of resistance in farm fish were not increasing. That was a little bit of a, of a surprise uh, to us. So they're fairly stable at a high level of B50 of 0 0.4, 0 0.5. And in the captured fish, when you look at the evolution of resistance level over time, we actually measured the decrease and we were very puzzled by this. And our current interpretation, I mean, first of all, the sample size is, is much smaller, but our current interpretation is that this may reflect a general improvement in, uh, in hygiene conditions and uh, water treatment, so drinking water and, uh, and sewage treatment uh, in coastal area in, in low income countries over the last uh, decade. And so there might be actually less bacterial contamination in the humans that manipulate uh, those fish uh, on, the, on the market. And to finish, I'll just say a little word uh, about the data uh, that we use. So everything's in open access uh, at something called resistancebank.org. You can check it out now on your, on your phone if you want. Uh, the platform is still very much in its early days. Uh, so we have to take any uh, sort of feedback uh, on that. We try to provide visibility to every researcher in low and middle income countries. So we report all the information about resistance uh, resistance rates, uh, links to original publication, etc. We had a friend in India uh, who I didn't suspect this use of resistance bank, but he was looking for specific uh, resistant genes and people who had uh, samples with those genes. And he sort of did the reverse engineering of looking for who might have uh, samples of, of things that are resistance and present certain genes in order to find collaborators. And we didn't really uh, anticipate that it could be sort of used this way. But in any case, if you work on resistance and one day you do a survey, you can upload the result of your survey here to be uh, seen on the map. We literally put your name uh, when somebody passes the cursor on, on different surveys. And we have a little YouTube uh, video to uh, show you uh, how, this, uh, how this can be done. And I think I'll stop here. And yeah, thanks very much again for the, for the invitation. Um, oh yeah, and one more thing, if you're interested in this topic and you're looking for postdocs and PhD, feel free to drop me an email. Uh, I'll have some money in the coming months. So, thanks. Mm -hmm. Can you show us timelines and maps? Is there any way of combining this in such a way that you can see from where the, from where the uh, AMR spreads into landscapes? Yeah, sure. So the, I repeat, the question is to how do we combine space and time here and to see where certain lineages originate from? So in an ideal world, I'd love to do that. Uh, I don't have the phylogenetic expertise to do it at the moment, so I'll be looking to hire people with expertise. Uh, but at the moment, we don't store genetic information on the platform. And we also don't want to duplicate uh, 
this like gene bank or Patrick or Enteral base. Uh, but yes, yeah, that's that will be the holy grail if I have much more money in the future. Yeah. But we don't do it at the moment. We stay on the phenotypic side. In the trends uh, of uh, antibiotic resistance, there was a lot of uh, variants. Yeah. So, so I was I was wondering if uh, you would have looked in the developed countries, where in theory you would have much more information on the use of uh, uh, antibiotics and the emergence of resistance. Where, you, where, where, where would you be able to really confirm that maybe in the past before the regulations? You would have this link between use and antibiotic and antimicrobial resistance. Sure. Um, shall I repeat this one too? No. Okay. 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 So, um, to do it in a systematic way for all high income countries at the same time, that would be quite a, quite a huge uh, exercise. But this, what you suggest, has been done by individual countries precisely to support change in policy. So, the classic example. Uh, in Canada, for example, where they, they banned a drug as soon as sort of the public health reports were, were, were out, because clearly there was an increase in resistance in humans uh, due to an increase in resistance uh, in, uh, in animals. I think you can see a change in resistance in Denmark as well uh, after they implement some very strict policies to restrict, to restrict antibiotic use uh, on the farm as well. So it has been done for certain countries, it has supported policies. The best of my knowledge, it has not been done with sort of standardized data between all high income countries. What we're doing at the moment is trying to collect the point prevalence surveys, so independent surveys, uh, done in Europe, try to see if it matches uh, the national trends reported by the government. But that's very much in progress at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So it's that's a super good question, but it's actually super hard. Yeah, sorry. So the, the question was about whether we see an effect on the on the sort of the the legal aspect to, of access to drug between different countries and the higher rates of, of resistance or, or use. Uh, I think it's a super good question, but it, it's hard to turn uh, text of law into uh, ordinal viable, basically. Uh, and I think it's something we should do, but we haven't sort of systematically reviewed what's the law everywhere and potential changes in the law and translate that into a viable with, let's say, three or four levels of, of a restriction. Uh, so yeah, basically good question, but we should do it, but it takes time and we need somebody to read the law of the different countries in all the languages. So uh, I don't know, you want to do it? <laughs> so we have a question online by uh, Julio. Julio, if you can activate your microphone and ask your question. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, for your great talk. And my question was, how do you account for different uh, IMR screening methods on, on your surveys, whether it's medium with antibiotics or whether they are actually looking at individual bacteria and doing the, the phenotypic screening? So we, we compared all the, the resistance rate obtained within each country for either this diffusion or, or microdilution. We did not find a systematic difference in the rates depending on the, on the screening method. What we did do, however, is to take into account uh, variation in breakpoint and the use of different uh, microbiological guidelines for defining, uh, defining uh, resistance, such that every rate is compared as if it was made uh, with the same, uh, same breakpoint uh, break value. So, so we went back and collected all the breakpoints from CLSI and, uh, and, uh, and the other one, I forgot the name, the European one. Um, so we tried to take that into, into account. Another question on, on that trend, that decreasing trend in uh, resistance of uh, uh, tra uh, trapped uh, uh, fish. Yeah. That's, like wild, that's wild fish, right? That's this fish yeah. that is not cultivated. Yeah. 
So, and uh, you, you hypothesize that it's perhaps due to a low release of antibiotics in, uh, in coastal areas, right? No, so I'm better, I've not been very clear, so I'll repeat that. Um, First of all, maybe you can yeah. also say, like, when is that tested? Is it tested after the, is it tested when they reach the land? That means, yeah. so is it tested after they have been transported and, you know, like went to the slaughterhouse, to the market? Yeah, so that's where I was not clear. It's on the market. And so what we think we're measuring there is because those fish are handled by the fishermen and the people of the, yeah. In fact, we may well be measuring human contamination, decrease of human contamination, because on average today, the humans may have less carrying less, uh, less, uh, less bacteria uh, that are resistant. Or, uh, but again, it's like an equal 80 sample because that's all what exists at the moment. So. Yeah. Maybe we do that in three years again with the sample size becomes bigger and, and my hypothesis goes to the water. No, it's, it's, it's an interesting result. That's why I'm, I'm, uh, I'm asking. Like maybe, maybe thinking of per particular type of stock, like where it is fished, maybe this could clear the picture of it if it's possible with the data. Like if you can really look at stocks that are, you know, like really at coastal versus, you know, more on the open seas. Maybe that would help to discriminate that human effect or of the it's, real coastal effect. It's rare that you have the information about where the fish has been fished uh, because it's all market stuff, basically. And I think even the people yeah, on the yeah, market I see, I see. who are selling the fish, they may not know, in all honesty, yeah, yeah. where the fish from, basically. Yeah. No, no, it's all animal. No, 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 no. So they're all from healthy animals, actually. They're all from healthy animals. Uh, so they're not, we, we excluded explicitly all the surveys made on specifically sick animals to try to prevent sampling bias towards a, towards a very, very bad bug. Uh, but if you go on, on resistance bank, we, I don't remember exactly the categories, and I, some are droppings like uh, chicken shit, basically. Uh, some are uh, sequel. Uh, you have to break down if you're interested in only a subset of the, of the database. We have four or five categories, I think, I think on resistance bank, uh, in which we have pooled the different surveys based on the, the type of sample. Mm -hmm. To be very honest with you, I don't know what's the breakdown by heart between uh, between the, the origin of the of the sample. Uh, but yeah, again, if I, I have it online so that I don't have to remember it, <laughs> basically. Uh, but yeah, but what I'm sure is we excluded explicitly everything that came from sick animals. It's, it's mostly stuff from the slaughterhouse and the markets. No, this this will do so. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit louder? Yeah. So so we don't explicitly model farmers' behavior. Sorry. Uh, how did we take into account farmers' behavior in reacting to attacks on, on antibiotic, if I'm paraphrasing you right? Uh, the short answer is we didn't. So all what we did here is collect data on price elasticity of demand for, for, for the few antibiotics for which we, we could find some information about that. Or really just having price data on antibiotic is very difficult. Now, with respect to your question, we didn't try to do some farm level uh, uh, simulation of how, how farmers uh, may react to that. I'm speculating here, but I suspect that uh, for the big groups, this, the decision is purely economical. You know, most of the chicken uh, production, especially in Asia, it goes through integrators and the, it's contract farmers, right? They receive the feed. They don't even know what's in the feed. They, they raise the animals and they give back uh, the, the, the product, so the, the grown animal to the integrator that then brings it to the slaughterhouse of the integrator. So the, the integrator uh, is the name of the, the big company that, uh, that uh, that uh, deals with the whole process. 
I think the integrator, if it's not worth it for them to put antibiotic in the food anymore, it's going to be purely economical decision. They say no, just in the same way they would be managing a chemical plant. Uh, but that's my suspicion that they would they would uh, just uh, stop as soon as it become not cost beneficial. But it, you know, there's a huge uh, market now that is growing uh, about alternatives to antibiotics. I think many big producers they realize that they're going to have to phase that out progressively. They're fighting legislation, but at the same time, they see that the legislation is becoming more restrictive and they want to prepare themselves for a world with much less antibiotic being used. And so many, many feed companies, they are now trying to, to market uh, different alternatives and to like probiotic, prebiotic, or some virus molecules, I don't know. Uh, but they're very interested in setting that because they know it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a big market in the future. And there's a market for that because when people can sell their food, say, antibiotic free, they can charge more for that. Uh, so they, there's an interest in, in finding alternatives, even if they're sometimes a bit more expensive. No questions. I think we should thank uh, Thomas once more.